In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes it takes being without to appreciate what we have. Long-distance relationships are like this. After all, they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? Coming to the last dollar of your paycheck can also lead to appreciation. When you realize you don't have extra money for all the extra things, you come to see and appreciate all that you do have. I feel there are many things in our lives that are like this, that perhaps we take for granted things that we have each and every day. One of the examples I'd like you to consider of that at this time is your ability to see. In our gospel lesson, Jesus healed a man who was born blind, never able to see. Can you imagine that? Try that for a moment. Try just to imagine what it would, it's like not to be able to see. In fact, let's do a little experiment here, if you will, with me. Let's try and do a few simple tasks that Normally, you can do without any problem. Close your eyes. Go ahead, close your eyes. Now grab a hymnal. It's in front of you somewhere there. Okay, kind of fumble around, find. Okay, now find a pen. They're, in there, they're up there too, somewhere by the attendance cards. You can fill that out later. Okay, now find a piece of paper, and I want you to try and write your name if you can. Keep your eyes closed. Do the best you can. All right, now you can open them. Now, kind of look how you did. For some, maybe this wasn't so hard. Maybe for others, it was pretty difficult. Right? These simple tasks that normally are no problem now become an issue. Try it for some time. Maybe try it for an hour or maybe even a whole day. And you will quickly come to an appreciation of the ability to see. Now, this was the kind of appreciation the prophet Isaiah was encouraging for his people. He wanted them to appreciate, not to overlook the good things that God was doing for them, that they would trust in God and not turn to idols. He wanted them to keep their focus on God, who provides leadership for their life, a light to guide their way, realizing that opened eyes will follow the light. But not all eyes are opened, are, are, that are opened are also paying attention. Just as we imagined blindness with the fumbling and the foolishness, let's imagine now what it would be like without God. And let's start by imagining not having His law. We'll assume at this point that you still have a conscience, so at least we don't have to imagine complete chaos. But how would you know whether your conscience is dependable? How would you know whether your conscience is overly sensitive or not sensing at all? How would you know how to live your life to please the God before whom you will stand in your last moment? Without God's law, we would be blind. Or what if we try to imagine life without God's protection of us and His providing for us? And again, we'll assume maybe here that the laws of nature are still in effect. But remove His holy angels and how they would lift you up in their hands. Remove kind and compassionate people who would do generous acts for you, help you carry your burdens through the day. Remove any kind of working for your good. Take those things away, the good things that God provides every day, and you're left fumbling around in the darkness like the blind. Or let's imagine for a moment what it would be like without a relation, any relationship whatsoever with God. 
And I'm not going to make exceptions here. I want you to identify how little you have without God. You have no Savior in Jesus, so you are still in your sin. You have no deliverer from the devil and are at the mercy of a merciless killer. Certainly this is a horrible state to be in. To be without the light in this dark place. To not ever have any expectation of beholding the glory of the Lord. Sometimes it takes being without to appreciate what you have. We needed to use our imagination in this case with God. And in a couple of these instances, imagine things that we've never experienced because that's how faithful God is. He, so faithful is He in so many ways, each and every day to us. But what good is it to you? What does it mean for you? Just because your eyes are open doesn't mean you're paying attention. Just because your ears can hear doesn't mean you're listening. The question we ask today is this. Is God getting overlooked? Isaiah was dealing with people whose eyes were open, but they weren't seeing. It says in verse 20 of our lesson, You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. Some of those things we imagined a minute ago, that was Israel's reality. Well, what had happened? Why was God being overlooked? Well, think about your attention span. What is an attention span? It's that time where we can focus on any one given thing. For some, it's what, a few minutes? Others, maybe only a few seconds? For most of you sitting out there now, your attention span has probably reached its end. And that's okay. That's a normal thing for a public speaker to identify. After about seven, eight minutes, naturally, we just kind of shut down. So let's come back together. Okay, elbow the person next to you if you see they're not here. Got it? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to stay focused on any one thing for an extended time? Eventually, we start losing interest start losing motivation we lose any sort of uh, or we start to turn over instead to distractions around us there may come a point when i could be up here talking and nobody would be listening and while i could tell you how frustrating that would make me i'd rather have you think and consider how god responds to those who stop paying attention to him and it's not that there was the choice simply to close their eyes. In the case of Israel, they had turned to look at some other image. They were distracted like when you watch a commercial and just wait for your eyes to, to focus on the next flashing image. For Israel, in their case, they had turned to other images. They had turned to trust in idols. God wasn't interesting to them anymore. The same old message from the same old messenger wasn't moving their hearts. So they turned their worship away from the true God to trust in something else. Isaiah had very clear and pointed words for them in our lesson. He said, those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Isaiah's words speak to us. We in our world are surrounded by so many flashing lights, so many images that draw us away from trusting in God. So much to the point that we say, I trust in what I can see. I trust in what I can hold and touch. I trust in my own strength or I trust in my intelligence. I trust in what money can buy. I trust in people who won't let me down or who won't put me down, challenge me, or say that my feelings are wrong, that anything is right or wrong. Well then, yeah, what good is God to you? If your eyes have turned to focus on so many other things, then you're overlooking God and have become blind to Him. He means nothing to you. And the statement is true. Those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back 
in utter shame. Sometimes it takes being without to appreciate what we have. That doesn't have to be the case with God. That doesn't have to be the case with His leadership in our lives. That doesn't have to be the case with the light He wants to shine on us. Isaiah was not only a messenger to point out blindness in his people. Isaiah was also to bring into sight the beauty of what the servant of the Lord would do. And in this lesson, the servant of the Lord is depicted as doing something so beautiful for those who are blind. Verse 16, the servant of the Lord says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. Blind people can't see what's coming down the road. They need a guide to help them. If they were on their own on an unfamiliar path, they would stumble at every obstacle. But what does the servant of the Lord do? He sees the obstacles for us. Not only that, but he becomes a guide to help us around them. More than that, he uh, just gets rid of the obstacles, making the rough places smooth. But he doesn't stop there. He goes so far as to turn the darkness into light. The servant of the Lord brings sight to the blind. Jesus did that for the man in our gospel lesson in two ways. First, he did it for him physically. Made some mud with dirt and his saliva. Put it on the guy's eyes. Told him to go wash. And what? The man came home seeing. But our lesson will go on to explain that, that Jesus, uh, to show how Jesus brought sight to the man in another way. At the end of that chapter in John. We see how Jesus reveals himself to the man as the son of man. And what does the man do? He says, Lord, I believe. And he bows down to worship Jesus right there. Here was this guy. Eyes who were healed. Jesus wasn't there to be the first one to be seen. He had no idea who it was that, to, that he was to worship and thanks for this miracle. But clearly he wanted to recognize the man. He wanted to, to connect to him. He even wanted to share the good news about what he, this man had done for him. And then when Jesus reveals himself, what else can he do but bow down in worship? Jesus had given him sight. So many are the things that God has done for us. Jesus has been revealed to us through the gospel. And like the giving of sight to the blind, so Jesus has given us a heart that believes. And he stands before you now as the Son of Man, who took the place of mankind, who took your sins on in his flesh, carried them to the cross, and left the work of salvation finished there. Jesus is the servant of the Lord, who has turned your darkness into light that you can see clearly now and follow. Jesus has appeared to you as the light of the world. Your eyes are opened. Your eyes are opened now to follow the light, to get behind the leadership of Jesus and follow in step. And Jesus provides that leadership by giving us an, an authority for our lives, by giving us his law. And what does the, the, the lesson say about God's law? The servant says, it's, it pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. Great and glorious. That's how we view God's law not just as a passing suggestion, but as a rule for life. Something that guides us now, but also tomorrow into the next generation. Something to which we can turn when our conscience troubles us to know what is right and wrong. We have this thing, this leadership of Jesus. More than that, we have Jesus who leads us by providing all that we need in life. He does send His angels to do His bidding. He does provide us with health and strength so that we can provide for ourselves and families. He works in our lives so that we have all that we need. And then, of course, He leads us. 
He leads us by out of this life of darkness into the glory of heaven. Free from sin, free from death and the devil. Free to serve him who was so selfless in his service to us. Your eyes are opened. And opened eyes follow the light. So pay attention. If you've lost that focus, bring it back. If a person sitting next to you is out of focus, let them know it. And follow the light. Follow the light of Jesus, the lead of the one who was pleased to bring you out of darkness into his light. Amen.